Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Usually when I show up in a city, it's under a mandatory evacuation order, and there's millions of people trying to get out when they see me. So I appreciate you guys for, all, for uh, not taking off. And uh, I am the guy that holds onto the tree in the hurricane, by the way. That is me, and I love it. I, 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 I'm a huge nature junkie. I'm not an adrenaline junkie. A lot of people think that I am. I don't bungee jump. I have never bungee jumped. I don't jump out of airplanes every weekend. I'm a nature junkie. I love Mother Nature so much that I will literally travel to the ends of the earth in order to document her at her most extreme. And it all came about because of a simple decision. My life completely changed because of one decision I made many, many years ago, and that was that I wanted to dedicate my life to traveling the world, documenting extreme forces of nature, and then sharing what I've seen with the rest of the world. Every decision I make in life always goes back to that. I, it's my check and balance. It basically has allowed me to sculpt and engineer my life doing weird stuff in weird places that most people either are completely afraid of doing or wish they could do. Most people are afraid of doing it. Let's be honest. I do it so you don't have to, right? And for me, that, that, that drive, that philosophy, that passion for nature has been quite a ride. And the Angry Planet TV series has really allowed the embodiment of that philosophy to really come through for me. And the premise of the show is that the viewer rides along with me while I travel the world documenting these extreme forces of nature and then share it with the world through, through television. I mean, it is the perfect example of having some vision in your mind for years and always working towards it. If you're the pilot of an airplane and you don't know what city you're headed to, you're never going to get there. But the entire time, the pilot is always making corrections to head towards Honolulu or whatever city. And throughout the entire process leading up to Angry Planet, it just was a constant correction. And throughout the filming of the show, traveled to over 40 countries all over the world, from the radioactive zone at Chernobyl, to the Australian outback, from Uzbekistan to Iceland, Antarctica, uh, to a small inflatable rubber raft on the world's largest lake of sulfuric acid. I don't know why I thought that was a good idea, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, don't try that at home, by the way. I have to always put that disclaimer out there, don't try this at home, but really, who's going to do that? Most people don't have a lake of acid in their backyard. So, of course, I have to go and travel to find these things. And I got my start chasing tornadoes back 15 years ago or so. I traveled, took my first trip to Tornado Alley down in the central United States. And since then, I've witnessed between 70 and 80 tornadoes. And they come in all different shapes and sizes. And I even take people on tornado chasing tours. So if you're interested, <laughs> it can be done. It's a crazy, crazy thing. People travel from all over the world. They come, and they meet me in Oklahoma City. And it's a bizarre thing. We go, and we see this. And these tornadoes are really fantastic in, in, in many different ways. They're rare. It's like trying to find a needle in a haystack, but the haystack is moving at 100 kilometers an hour and totally has no regard for any traffic laws whatsoever. So trying to find them, catch up to them is difficult. I had to teach myself all the forecasting involved, how to navigate around these storms, how to do it safely. The storms that produce these tornadoes are sometimes twice the height of Mount Everest, concentrating all of their force down onto a central point, which is that tornado that's grinding up a farmer's field. And along with that driving philosophy of mine of, of uh, tracking these things down and sharing what I've seen, I've also discovered over the years that if you want something you've never had, you must do things that you have never done. And I have made a career out of doing things that I have never done and doing things that no one else has, has done as well. And most of the time, there's a reason why no one's ever done it before, like stringing ropes across a boiling lake and dangling above it or being frozen solid in a wind tunnel or I could go on and on. And certainly for me, I never strive to be the best. If you're the best at something, that's great. Good for you. But someone is always going to come along and be better than you. 
I prefer to be first at doing something. Because once you've done that, no one can ever take it away from you. And that has been uh, a recurring theme, certainly throughout the Angry Planet TV series. But nature is capricious. Nature is, is crazy. It's destructive. And natural phenomena in and of themselves are not destructive. When a natural phenomena affects human populations, that is when the phenomena goes from being just a force of nature to a natural disaster. A tornado touching down in an open field doesn't affect anyone. And that's what I want to see. I'm not there to chase disaster. I'm an explorer. I explore parts of the world that are undergoing extreme transition. Uh, a, a hurricane that's making landfall, a tornado that's touching down, a volcano that happens to be erupting. These moments in time are brief, and we've reached the poles. We have reached the summit of Mount Everest. There are lineups at the summit of Mount Everest. People die waiting in line. That realm of exploration is done. There's only a few places in the world left to explore. The deep seas, space, deep caverns. For me, it's documenting these places that are under extreme transition, but unfortunately, sometimes that transition wreaks havoc on the people that live there. In Joplin, Missouri last year, May 22nd, it happened to be my birthday. It was the first day of one of the tours. Welcome aboard, guys. Here we go. Typically, we take them out. We watch the storms. If a tornado happens, great. Awesome. Usually, it doesn't affect anyone. This day, the storm was an EF5. The scale only goes up to 5. I was watching on the radar as the storm hit this town head on. We were no less than two minutes behind the tornado, and we couldn't even see it. It was wrapped in rain and hail. It was invisible to us. We knew it was there. We knew the damage and destruction that was being caused, pieces of houses, door hinges flying around like ninja throwing stars. When we got to the point where the tornado had crossed the road uh, just on, on the interstate highway, we had to stop and lend first aid, helping out with some truckers that had flipped over. So we chase. If someone needs our help, we stop. We land a hand. So that is where the phenomenon becomes a disaster. And some of them are quite large. Uh, hurricanes, for example, can be 600 kilometers across, 800 kilometers across. A tornado, a large one, might be two kilometers across. And they're the most massive storms in the world. I've been to about 16 of them in several different countries, the Caribbean, US, Canada. And by far, the worst was Hurricane Katrina. For me, I knew where it was going to hit several days in advance. I drove from Toronto for a day and a half straight down to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. I chose not to go to New Orleans for a couple of reasons. I knew that the weak side of the storm was going to hit New Orleans. The strong side was going to hit Mississippi. New Orleans got off easy. Believe it or not, it could have been a lot worse. If the storm had done a little wobble to the west, then the strong side would have hit. We knew New Orleans was going to flood no matter what, so we decided to not go there. And it could have been 100 times worse than it actually was. Worst case scenario, not even close. So in the parking garage, we stayed up all night. The, the, the warnings coming out of the National Weather Service were apocalyptic. They were saying that Buildings were going to sway to the point of collapse. Small appliance, large appliances and small cars were going to become deadly airborne missiles. And I'm reading this 12 hours before the storm is about to make landfall. And I don't know if I'm going to survive the next 24 hours. And it really puts life in perspective when you have that time to sit there and ponder what's going to happen over the next 24 hours. And I, I, I remember sitting there pontificating about whether this bank building is going to collapse on me or not, and how far away from it do I have to be. And it is a surreal experience that, that I hope you never have to go through. But I, for some bizarre reason, I, cho I choose to do this. And it's more, about, it's more about passion than it is about than it is about money. I don't make a lot of money doing it. I do it because I love it. Uh, it's a Canadian TV network. We don't make a lot of money. <laughs> it's Canada. Come on. So it's all about passion. And being in these storms, feeling the force of nature, feeling these 100-foot waves crashing onto you in Peggy's Cove, 
It's just a fantastic, fantastic experience. And we are so separated from nature. Think about it. When was the last time you touched a tree? We get up in the morning in our air-conditioned house. We get in our air-conditioned car. We go to our air-conditioned work. We eat a fast food meal. We go back home, maybe order a pizza or make, throw something in the microwave. We are extremely separated from nature, but we are as much a part of nature as any other creature. We can trace our genetics back to the beginning of life on Earth. But yet, most people don't get the opportunity to see much of it. So that's where I step in. And sometimes it's a storm, sometimes it's a volcano. This is Sumeru in Java on Indonesia. Fantastic volcano, climbed up to the summit of it. It is spectacular, it erupts every 20 minutes or so. And I'm such a freak when it comes to volcanoes. I admit I'm a freak, I know you're thinking, this guy either does really cool stuff or he's a total idiot. It's okay, I'm used to it. Ask my mom. She's got more gray hairs than she deserves. But I did manage to convince my wife to get married on the crater's edge of an exploding volcano. <laughs> and that was pretty cool. The proposal went something kind of like this. Honey, will you marry me? She said, yes. Off to a good start. And then, of course, I sweetened the pot. What do you think about the idea of getting married on a beautiful tropical South Pacific island? This is uh, Vanuatu in the South Pacific. She said, yes. And then I snuck in. How about on the crater's edge of an exploding volcano? <laughs> she said, yes. And of course, that's when I knew that she was absolutely the one for me. And <laughs> it was a fantastic ceremony. There, we had the locals in their, in their uh, grass skirts and, and face painted. The volcano would erupt every few minutes with these glowing lava bombs flying hundreds of meters through the air, easily within reach of hitting us. And at the end of the ceremony, we pop the cork on the champagne, the champagne goes flying in the air, and the volcano has one last eruption. It was this great metaphor for marriage. This violent, hot, explosive, unpredictable mess. And it was great. Really, really awesome. <laughs> but let me, go, let, let me come back and, uh, and get, get back into um, sort of why I, why I do this. Um, Nature, for me, when I was growing up, my two heroes were Jacques Cousteau and Indiana Jones. So I, would try, I, I got used to this idea of adventure and, and, and exploration, but then I suppressed it, and I became an engineer. I studied, went to school, went through the education system. I wasn't traveling to Antarctica then. I wasn't in the Sahara Desert then. I wasn't flying in a helicopter over forest fires in northern Ontario back then. I had a regular job working as an engineer designing and building recording studios, some of the biggest in the world. Cool job. I loved it. But I would take this passion of mine and develop it through my time off, and I would negotiate extra time off, and I would, I would take time off without pay. Just, just let me go. I got to go. And it got to the point where my employers would say, well, I heard on the news there's a hurricane coming. Why are you still here? And I'm like, I agree, see, I'll see you in a week, maybe, because I might get trapped down somewhere for, you know, in a for a week because there's no electricity and all the trees are across the road, and that's the kind of thing that would happen. And it got to the point where I was expected to be at these places and getting calls from news agencies and newspapers, and that's sort of how the Angry Planet show developed because I developed the reputation for being the guy that was on the scene when all hell was breaking loose somewhere. But it's not just about the danger and the and the the adrenaline from the the adrenaline is a byproduct of the of the nature that I pursue. These lightning bolts are spectacular. They're but there's other beauty in the world as well, more subtle beauty and things that I had to find out for myself what they were like. And the most spectacular place that I ever had the, the absolute pleasure and honor of going to was this place, the Nica Crystal Cave in Mexico. Most people have never heard of it. It was found accidentally in a silver mine about 12 years ago. And it's 900 feet underground. These miners broke through and found the world's largest crystals. The cave itself is about the size of a basketball court. And the crystals weigh, well, the big ones are 55 tons. No one has ever seen anything like this. It's like Superman's Fortress of Solitude <laughs> at the North Pole. North Pole, right? But 
the environment inside the cave is as deadly as it is beautiful. The air temperature inside is 52 Celsius with near 100% humidity. So you've got the heat of the Sahara Desert combined with the humidity of the Amazon jungle. As soon as you walk into this cave, you start to die. <laughs> and your survival time is measured in minutes. I didn't know how I was going to get here, but I knew I was going here. <laughs> and that's another thing that, that has been a theme throughout my life, is that I don't always know how I'm going to do something. I just know what I want to do, and I find the way to do it. It took two years to get permission to go here. It's privately owned by the mining company. It's difficult to go there. It's very expensive. There's all, you need to have uh, medical checkups several times throughout the day when you're there. Anyway, it's, it's, it's insane. It's crazy. But I knew I had to get there. I finally had the opportunity to go. We went. And in order to explore the cave in any kind of detail, you have to wear these special cooling suits. And the cooling suits are filled with ice, and, and you breathe this chilled air so that you can spend 35 minutes inside at a time, as opposed to 12 minutes without dying. And when you come back out, you're dripping with sweat. You're on the verge of heat stroke. And it really is this visceral, difficult, harsh place that is spectacular. It really is amazing. But the most fear I've ever experienced was not in a tornado, not in a hurricane, nothing like that. It was in another cave in Africa, and it was because of a stupid little bat. <laughs> Last story. Kidam Cave, Kenya, known for two reasons. Number one, it's the only place in the world where elephants go underground. 100 meters, complete pitch black. They scrape the cave walls with their tusks, and they chew the rocks to get salt. And that's, that's how they get their nutrients, their salt at, the, at these high altitude caves. You can see the tusk marks in the walls. It's also been the epicenter for two outbreaks of Marburg hemorrhagic fever. You probably never heard of it. Have you heard of Ebola? It's the same family of virus. So if you catch it, you get a headache, fever, and then your internal organs liquefy, and you bleed them out. Let's go here. <laughs> so I figured out a way. We went there. I know, I know. I roll my eyes at myself sometimes. I was with a bat biologist. We go to the back of the cave. I've got a gas mask on, surgical gloves, special Tyvex suit. I'm set. I'm prepared. I can, do, I can get anything. You know, No problem. I, I, I'm not going to catch anything. It's going to be great. I get to the back of the cave. We flip on the lights to film. The bats come screaming out. They're emptying their bladders and their bowels all on us. It's just horrible. I catch one of these bats, and I want to show it to the camera because that's what I do. I'm in television now, so I have to show stuff to the camera. Well, stupid me, I forgot to put my thick leather gloves on. It bites through my glove into my finger, and now I don't know if I have a week and a half left to live. But despite all that, obviously I didn't catch the, the Marburg virus because I'm here. I would have died uh, within a week. But despite that horrible experience, it doesn't really matter. I've learned from it. I know now to be better prepared. and. Certainly, if you want something you have never done, or sorry, if you want something you've never experienced, you must do things that you have never done. And I hope to speak with some of you later about some of the things that you want to do. And I appreciate it so much. Thank you for your time.